Jesus, you're the center of my joy.
Good morning, Tridestone, and to all of our friends of Tridestone. We bless God for your presence today. I want to encourage you to pay careful attention to the word that God has given for this week. There are some critical, uh, basic, fundamental Christianity issues that the Lord has been speaking to me about that is really important in this season. Go with me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to share your truth. Your word is truth, and we pray in the name of Jesus that you will open it up in such a way that your children will walk in obedience to you. Help us to uh, understand your ways in order that your kingdom would come and your will would be done in us. Bless now these, your words in Jesus' name. Amen. Over the last uh, several weeks, we've been dealing with that key word found in John 15, where Jesus says, ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you to do. That word whatsoever is a, is a prominent word, words that need to be uh, really understood and featured in the lives of every Christian. It really opens up uh, all of the boundaries that we set in God's way. If we don't operate in whatsoever God tells us to do, then what we're doing is we're operating to the rationale of our own minds rather than in obedience to our Father uh, who leads and guides and directs us. So we miss opportunity uh, for blessings simply because we're operating in sacrifice. We're not operating in obedience. As a matter of fact, many people who have gone to church their whole lives may have had only select moments where they actually obeyed God. And all other times were likely just uh, ideas that they had that uh, they brought to God as, as, as sacrifice, but not realizing that it was a sacrifice, counted it as obedience. And this is the, the, the risk that we have for disregarding some of the Bible examples. The Bible should really establish uh, a precedent for things. The Bible should really be the example of God's ways to the church. But for the most part, uh, when we read the Bible, we, we don't necessarily take those examples or circumstances that the word is teaching out of and apply them to today. We typically uh, disregard some very prominent teachings that the Lord gave. So today, I, I want to deal with the specifics of the whensoever of the whatsoever. The whatsoever, as we've been talking about, is when you are willing to do whatever Jesus tells you to do because you are his friend. And there is an aspect of with the, the whatsoever that we need to focus on today. And that is the whensoever of the whatsoever. And that is the key to obedience. The only way that you can actually really be obeying God is if you have responded to a whensoever moment, to a whatsoever commandment of the Lord. Those things must line up in order for you to actually be obe obedient to God. And we're going to walk through that today. And I want you to be uh, patient with the word today because so many things that we, we don't know about the Bible is because people have gotten tired of, of paying attention to the scripture. You want a summary without the substance. And we miss key things that the Lord would have us know. So I'm going to read through uh, a section of the book of Numbers, chapter 14. I'm going to be picking up at verse 22 uh, through the balance of the chapter to verse 45. But before we get to this moment, uh, the, the reason why I'm, I'm picking up here is there's, there's things that happened before that are critical to understand. So let me summarize that before uh, where I'm going to pick up and read today, the children of Israel have gotten to Kadesh. And when they got to Kadesh, they decided to send out 12 spies into the land, uh, a representative for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. They went and spied out the land. Uh, they came back uh, with a report that yes, the land is, is great land, is, it flows with milk and honey. And, you know, all of that is good, but uh, the, the, wall, the cities are walled cities. We saw the children of Anak there. So they were afraid of the size 
of the confrontation that was going to be required in order for them to operate in the whatsoever God said, which was to cross into this, this place and take the land. That was God's commandment. It was the whatsoever. It was not, and I, I want to amplify for just a minute. When you get specific instruction from God, that is on the same par as the Ten Commandments. It is the specific thing that God wants you to do in order to be obedient. And if you are a friend of Jesus, it matters to you to do whatsoever God is saying. And the children of Israel were still kind of, you know, rebelling against having to obey God for a specific direction. Uh, operating to the commandments can be, you know, basically based upon our interpretations of things. But when you get to the realm of operating in whatsoever God says, it means that you are a sheep that knows his voice and you're following him. That's what's really missing in today's world. And it is because we ignore the Bible as precedent setting. It should tell us what to do today because of what it said back then. And I want to give you an example of that so that you can begin to see the importance of whensoever of the whatsoever. That is the key to obedience. Whensoever is connected to the whatsoever if you are obedient to God. So the children of Israel um, had the spies come back. Ten of the spies gave a negative report. And when they brought back word, the people were upset. They cried all that night. They woke up the next day angry with Moses and Aaron. They, they wanted to stone Joshua and Caleb for coming back and saying that we could go and take the land. The people rose up with an accusation against God. They even said, would God that we had died in Egypt? Or would God that we had died in this wilderness? And God, why have you brought us out here to, to fall by the sword and to have our wives and our, our children to be a prey uh, uh, to, to, these, to these people that are in this land, these giants that are in the land? And so their, their fear caused them to speak unbelief back to God. Their, their lack of faith in the Lord caused them to speak unbelief and accusations back to God simply because they did not in their rational minds see how what God was saying, the whatsoever that God was saying, they did not see the possibility of success in obeying God. So they wanted to go back to Egypt. They wanted to go back to the wilderness. So God handles us, and I need to make this very clear. Sometime your own mouth has cursed you. Sometime you have opened your mouth and you have spoken unbelief. And that is an accusation against God. It is declaring that God is not true to his word. And I want you to see in this passage of scripture, God takes it very personally when we speak unbelief concerning him. Look at what it says, beginning at verse 22 of Numbers chapter 14. It says, because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice. Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers. Neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land, whereinto he went, and his seed shall possess it. Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwelt in the valley. Tomorrow turn you and get you into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they have murmured against me. Say unto them, as truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to the whole number from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Doubtless ye shall not come into the land 
concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. But your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness, and your children shall wander in this wilderness forty years to bear your whoredom until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of the days in which ye searched the land, even forty days, each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquity, even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. I, the Lord, have said, I will sh surely do it unto all this evil congregation that have gathered together against me, in this wilderness they shall be consumed, and, they, and there they shall die. And the men which, which Moses sent to search the land, who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him by bringing up a slander upon the land, even those men, men that did bring up the evil report upon the land died by the plague before the Lord. But Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of the men that went to search the land, lived still. And Moses told these sayings unto all the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. And they rose up early in the morning and got them up into the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we be here, and will go up unto the place which the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. And Moses said, Wherefore do ye transgress the commandment of the Lord? But it shall not prosper. Go not up, for the Lord is not among you, that ye be smitten before your enemy. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and ye shall fall by the sword, because ye are turned away from the Lord. Therefore the Lord will not be with you. But they presumed to go up unto the hilltop, Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. Then the Amalekites came down, and the Canaanites which dwelt in that hill, and smote them, and discomfited them, even unto Hormah. So again, we hear the, the details of God's reaction to a murmuring, unbelieving people. They came back with a negative report. They declared that God had brought them out to this place to die by the sword and for their children and their wives to become a prey. They spoke unbelief and they did not realize the whensoever of the whatsoever. I'm trying to get this clearly embedded in everyone's mind. Moments like this are like a funnel where you pour into a funnel and it narrows down to a specific point where purpose can be found. And that's really where I want to go. Matter of fact, let's, let's take a look at it. I'll show you why God was so angry with the children of Israel and would not allow them to even make up their own mind to go on the second opportunity where they got up the next day and said, well, we're going to go and we're going to go and take the land because, look, we're still here. I want you to know something. Everything that is involved in obedience to God comes by way of season, time, and purpose. It's a funnel. It's larger at the top. A season declares the time, and the time declares the purpose. Go, go to Ecclesiastes 3 real quick to, to explain in more detail what I'm getting at. Because some of you might think, well, they, they decided to, to go ahead and try to take the, take the land, when they realized that they had made a mistake. I want you to know that everything that we do that does not require faith is a sin. Everything that we do, every time we call ourselves doing something for the Lord, if it's not done in obedience to his voice and done at the time that he designates, it is sin. The Bible says if any man would come unto God, that he must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's it out of, out of Hebrews eleven six. Everything that we do that is not done in faith is 
of sin. And we have practiced sin and we have operated in sacrifice and have never desired to obey God because we don't understand the alignment between season, time, and purpose. Season declares the opportunity, the window for time, and time declares the window of opportunity for purpose. And God has established everything consistently. But we have ignored God's ways. And for that reason, we don't understand the whensoever of the whatsoever. Because if you're not responding in the right time to the whatsoever commandment, you have not obeyed God. It is simply that straightforward. God must be obeyed, not only in the whatsoever, but at the right time, the whensoever. Take a look at what it says in Ecclesiastes 3, verses 1 and 2. It says, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Verse 2, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. The relationship between season, time, and purpose is always aligned under heaven. God establishes seasons, and then God establishes within the season designated times for his purpose to be carried out. And time is subject to the season, and purpose is subject to the time. There is a designated window of opportunity to obey God. And that is exactly what Numbers 14 points out. There is a specific window of opportunity of obedience. When the day passed, when the people came back the next day and said, well, we're here, we might as well go ahead and, and go forward because now that we know we've sinned. Well, look, God does not want us to call ourselves obeying him when we did not trust him. God has given, as a matter of fact, he says, these were the same people who were in Egypt and saw the 10 plagues on Egypt. These are the same people who saw the miracles in Egypt. These are the same people who saw the miracles in the wilderness. These are the same people that God allowed to win battles one after another in the wilderness. It's the same people whose shoes never wore out. It's the same people whose clothes never wore out. It's the same people that ate manna because God provided it every day. It's the same people that complained about meat and God gave them quail. God provided for everything every single day for the people of Israel. And when it came time for them to take what was promised them, they were cowards and they did not give credit to God for everything that he had done all the way back to Egypt when he sent Moses to come and tell the Pharaoh to let my people go. God expects us to see the cumulative effect of his providing for us as an opportunity to believe him more for the next thing. But it is as if we are operating in spiritual amnesia. When God does something for us, we forget about it and put more demands on God to do things the way we think rather than what he says and what he requires of those who are supposed to be sheep that know his voice. They got to know the whensoever of the whatsoever in order to find the key to obedience. Season, time, and purpose must align. Season declares the time, and time declares the purpose. If you don't respond to the time that God establishes, then the purpose moves away. And God allowed the purpose to move away from the children of Israel because they preferred to do things when they felt like it rather than doing it when God said. They had no faith. The Lord shared something with me early this morning that I want to share with you as a, as, a, as a revelation. I want you to understand that your love for God is equivalent to your faith in God. You cannot love God more than you trust him. So if you don't trust him, your love for God is diminished by that lack of trust. And God is not going to provide for you in the way that you want him to when you don't trust him. He does not reward disobedience. He wants us to understand 
And God has consistently handled his affairs this way. As a matter of fact, go with me over to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 15. And let me give you a little background on this. This is just to show you another example of how God requires us to operate between the, the whensoever leading to the whatsoever. This is the story of King Saul, who had been given a commandment to go and to utterly destroy Amalek. He's given that instruction by Samuel. Samuel is the one uh, who heard from God. Samuel's anointing was still in place to help the king, the leader, to go and execute God's plan. So God gave him a whatsoever assignment. And I want you all to get this. This is, not, this is not talking about the Ten Commandments. This is talking about doing what God specifically declared that he wants you to do. And many people who go to church don't have any kind of relationship with God in that place. And if you don't have, a, have that kind of relationship with him, then you need to really check to see if you're a sheep. Because Jesus said, Jesus who cannot lie, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice and they follow me. So if you're not hearing anything, you better cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, help me to discern your voice so that I can do whatsoever you command and so I can be considered your friend. King Saul gets instruction from Samuel and look at what it says in verse 3 of 1st Samuel 15, it says, Now go and smite Amalek, and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Now, I want to explain, because some of you are saying, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. You mean God said kill man and woman, infant and suckling? All, just kill everything God said to do that? Yes. And I want to explain to you that God does not judge the way we think. So don't set yourself up as a judge of God. God knows what he's doing. Because we're talking about Amalek here. Amalek was the first group of people who came out to attack the children of Israel when they left Egypt and were on their way to the promised land. And God, God allowed us to know in the book of Exodus that they attacked from behind. They, they, they attacked the old and the weak. And, and God was angry and said, I will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. And it is because of Saul that Amalek continued on because Saul did not do what God wanted done. So God will judge individuals. God judges cities. God judges nations. And God judges generations. And God is judging a generation of Amalek for attacking his children. And God wanted them utterly wiped out. Go, go down to verse 20 so you can see what Saul actually did. I want you to understand that there, there is a whensoever window that's supposed to line up to the whatsoever commandment that God gives us. Look at what happened in beginning at verse 20 in, in 1 Samuel 15. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, and as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned. 
for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. Are you beginning to get the picture? Saul was given a specific commandment. God knew what he wanted. He told the king to go and do it. He sent it by way of Samuel. Samuel gave the instruction and Saul went out. And Saul is only doing what we are doing every day of the week right now. Every day of the week, we get a word from the Lord, we get instruction from the Lord, and then we start mixing it in with our rational thinking. Well, God shouldn't really mean it this way. God didn't really mean to utterly destroy everybody. See, because look at what, look at what uh, Saul did. He saved the king alive. Why did he save the king alive? Because he was a king and he felt like because of his status that he shouldn't have to die. So he was catering to the man's status. And then these people were catering to their own uh, lust for, for, for wealth. And they kept what they thought was good. And then they claimed, oh no, we're doing this for the Lord. We're going to sacrifice at Gilgal. No, they were keeping the best stuff because they were greedy. And greed, I, I got I to share this. It's not from the text that we're preaching from today. But I got to tell you, the Lord reminded me this week that everything that the prophetic utterance concerning this world all the way to the end of time is springs forth from the source of greed. The people of God didn't let the land rest. And God is carrying out these last days, the fulfillment of prophecy and the amount of time lining up season, time, and purpose because greed provoked God. Greed, the evil that is the common thread of the United States of America. Greed, driving all of our decisions and interrupting the whensoever of the whatsoever. We don't seem to have a clue as to how to obey God because we have greed glasses on. We only see things based upon our greed. We don't discern the ways of God, the will of God, the move of God, because we don't see the Bible as establishing precedent for us to benefit from. The word of God is given to us so that we can understand the ways of God. When the children of Israel got to Kadesh and they didn't want to cross over, they were using their minds. Their minds got the best of them. Fear got the best of them because they thought, how could God be sending us to go up against the children of Anak? How could God be expecting us to go up against these walled cities? But you got to understand something. God deserves credit for everything that he does. Every blessing he's given you should put you in position to believe him for the next blessing he wants to give you. If you don't believe, it means not only do you not believe, it means you don't love him like that. Because your love for God is restricted by your faith. Whatever you believe him for, you can also love him for that. But for everything you don't believe him for, you don't love him for that thing. There is an inseparable connection. There is a correlation between your love for God and your faith in God. And it makes sense that the great commandment says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Because your love for God causes you to believe God. It causes you to trust God. But without that, if you don't trust God, then you also do not love him. God knew that. God allowed it for the children of Israel who were rebellious there at Kadesh to go and wander in the wilderness until their carcasses fell in the wilderness. And every word of unbelief that they spoke back to God that he said he heard it in his ear, said, everything you said about me, I'm going to use your own words to punish you. I'm going to use your unbelief to chastise you. I want you to know that process is still going on right now where people speak unbelief and you are going to be judged. You are going to be punished for your mouth cursing you. Every time you open your mouth and you let your unbelief escape, God is going to hold you accountable for those words. That's the reason why it's death and life in the power of the tongue because what you believe about God 
comes out of your mouth. God wants us to benefit from his willingness to bless us. And the only one who really seemed to get this thing right is Jesus himself. Go with me to John chapter 5, and I'm, I'll be closing here. John chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. Jesus gives us the secret for discerning the whensoever of the whatsoever, which gives us the key to obedience. Jesus gives us the formula, the methodology for being able to discern the whensoever so that you can find the whatsoever. Look at what it says here in verses 19 and 20 of John chapter 5. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. Two things. Jesus said, you got to get this. The only begotten of God who walked on the water, who raised the dead, who turned water into wine, he said, I can do nothing of myself, but I do what I see my father doing. And whatever I see my father doing, that's what I do. So what Jesus is doing is using himself as an example for all who would believe on him to take on the same approach, to watch for the move of God. There is something that God is working around you every single day. There is something that God is trying to show you every single day. And you may be brushing it off as coincidence. You may be brushing it off as it's not, not important, not something you need to worry about, something that you should just overlook. God works with us by repeatedly trying to teach us something that we don't know. Jesus says, even I, the only begotten of God, can do nothing by myself. I only do what I see God doing first. So that is what is supposed to be happening. I want to tell you, this thing works. This thing really works. The reason why Tridestone is in this facility, because God showed us what he was doing, and then we joined him in what he was doing, so he worked the miracle because of it. And this, the second part of the second part of it in verse 20 is Jesus explains how this whole methodology works. Jesus says that the father loveth the son and showeth him all things that himself doeth. So what he's saying is, because the father loves me, he shows me what he's doing. So the key to discernment is not you, is the Father loving you and you believing that he does. Like, you got to get this. this. This is what God, and I, I, I tried to share this with people and it just sounded too strange to explain. But in the midst of God working this miracle for tried stone, God said something to me that sounded outlandish, but I knew I heard him. He said, and I've shared this before, he said, I need you to believe me as though I would do this for you above every man on the planet. What God was trying to do is to get me to line up with this passage. He was saying that I need you to believe that I love you enough to show you what to do. And what's happening in the church, and I mean the church universal, is that no one believes that God loves them enough to show them what's going on. And because you've given up on God showing you, you make it up on your own. You do it your own way. And you stay at sacrifice and never find obedience. Obedience is doing whatsoever at the whensoever 
moment. And if you miss the whensoever moment, the whatsoever is no longer available to you. The window closes. When the window closes on whensoever, whatsoever is no longer available to you. The people found out when they were at Kadesh. You can't just do it after you realize you made God mad. You can't just do it when it's on your terms and it no longer requires faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. God bless you. God keep you.